This is a picture of our planet, which is round. If you think that the Earth is flat, then you must be an idiot. <laughs> this is evidence from NASA that shows our Earth warming at a concerning rate. If you don't believe in human-caused climate change, then you must be stupid. And this is the equation required to calculate the orbital velocity of the satellite that helped contribute to that global warming data. If you don't know how to derive this equation, then you must be stupid. It is easy, and sometimes fun, to imagine that the people who don't understand the things that we understand are ignorant, or just plain stupid. But not only is that hurtful, it's also inaccurate. And worse, it's counterproductive to education, especially science education. I'm a science communicator. I am also from West Virginia. And growing up in West Virginia has fundamentally shaped the way that I talk about science. And that has mostly to do with this. West Virginia is number one in the entire country when it comes to the fewest number of people that believe global warming is happening. As you might imagine, this could have something to do with our state's relationship with coal, something that provides 30% of our nation's electricity, something that our state proudly has a lot of. But it's also something that is the single largest contributor of carbon dioxide emissions from human activity, contributing to global warming and therefore climate change. And so as a science communicator and a proud West Virginian, it's important to me that we work to get those numbers up. But you don't do that by calling those people stupid. An all too common tactic I've seen on social media. I pulled these tweets from Twitter just in the last month. Surprisingly, calling someone stupid does not inspire them to want to learn more about climate change. No, if you really want to get to the underlying reasons behind that West Virginia number, you first have to understand what it's like to grow up in West Virginia. West Virginia is an absolutely beautiful state, and our identity as West Virginians is closely associated with our land. Wild and wonderful West Virginia is known for our rolling hilltops, mountain climbing, whitewater rafting, country roads, and of course, our hunting and fishing. West Virginians are hardworking people who like to play on our land, and in many cases live off our land. But there is one thing that both people inside and outside the state associate with West Virginia, and that, of course, is coal. Now, if you're from inside the state, the story of coal that you've been told is inherently different than the story you'll hear elsewhere. As a child, the story you're told is one of a love story, a story of how lucky we are as West Virginians to be given this gift of coal, something that keeps the lights on for America. But as I grew older and left home, I also learned about the negative impacts that coal has on our state. The many deaths that have occurred on the job, black lung that is swept throughout Appalachia, and of course the chemical spills from coal plants like the one just a few years ago that left 300,000 West Virginia residents without water and cost our state tens of millions of dollars to clean up. But you don't typically learn about that stuff when you grow up in West Virginia. Chances are, if you grew up in West Virginia, you got most of your coal facts from this organization. Friends of Coal is an advocacy group founded by the coal industry. Their mission statement says that Friends of Coal is dedicated to inform and educate West Virginia citizens about the coal industry and its vital role in the state's future. Future, right? Friends of Coal and other coal industry groups accomplish that in two strategic ways. First, they recruit West Virginia cultural icons to be spokesmen for them at sports games, charity events, and in commercials to talk about how wonderful coal is and how great it is for our state. In the past, these spokesmen have included NASCAR drivers, professional bass fishermen, and head football coaches of the very popular football teams at West Virginia University and Marshall University. In fact, for many years, we had something called the Friends of Coal Bowl, where these two teams would come together and play each other. Now, this may seem insignificant, but it is particularly powerful. Because when you live in a state that generally ranks as one of the worst states across many national lists, including highest rate of obesity, highest percentage of people on food stamps, highest rate of drug overdose deaths, and lowest median income, 
You get it. When you live in a state where things aren't going so great, but the football team is good, you really latch on to the success of that football team and you hail the people making it so. When your idol supports coal, you kind of want to as well. And while this strategy is concerning, it's the second strategy that they employ that is the most troubling. And this is the work they do in schools. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of grants have been given to teachers across Appalachia who have been willing to implement coal lessons designed or approved by the coal industry. You can imagine how unbiased and scientific those lessons are. Unfortunately, this is a really appealing offer for teachers who are already not given enough money to buy the teaching lessons that their classrooms need. On a related uh, Coal in the Classroom program, the president of the West Virginia Coal Association has said, not only is coal our history and our legacy, but it is our future, and we need young coal miners. These kids answer all the questions that anybody has about coal. I'll bet they know more about it than many adults in West Virginia. And that's the significance of this Coal in the Classroom program. These kids are taught to be a friend of coal. They're taught that if you're not a friend of coal, then do you hate West Virginia? They're shown that coal is integral to their identity and they get this message from their teachers, representatives, West Virginia celebrities, and even their own parents who received the same message when they were kids. And so when I talk about climate change, I remember these kids. Because although economists will tell you that the coal industry is dying on its own, mostly thanks to market forces from cheaper alternatives, these kids are taught that it's only our war on climate change that is killing their coal industry. Essentially, they're taught that being environmentally friendly isn't friendly to them. And so they have all the incentives in the world to ignore the science on climate change. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't criticize this point of view, but we have to do it in the right way. Because if we paint these communities with a broad stroke and conclude that they don't understand the science because they are stupid, then we will never truly understand the issue. We'll never see the corporate influence, the history, the deep-seated pride behind the issue. We'll never be able to analyze the psychological, cultural, and many times emotional reasons why certain people deny science. And then we'll never be able to bridge the gap between what the public believes and what scientists know. And on that front, we have our work cut out for us because this problem extends far beyond West Virginia. This is what is known as the consensus gap across the board on various science topics, from the safety of genetically modified foods, to evolution, to human-caused climate change, there is a difference between what the public believes and what scientists who have concluded from extended research in the relevant field know, right? And this gap exists not because Americans are stupid. More education is not going to be a silver bullet for this problem because humans are not logical animals. We don't like to accept new information that doesn't perfectly align with our worldview. And while when our worldview is often shaped at such a young age, then we have to find new strategies for science communication. And I have two pieces of advice. The first thing that we can do to help bridge this gap in scientific knowledge is learn to listen to the communities we want to reach. Work to respect and empathize with them. Don't assume they're stupid. Essentially, be nice. That sounds obvious, but that is not what society has taught us. Society has taught us that if you're smart, you don't have to be kind. If you're a jerk, that's okay, as long as you're intelligent, as long as you're right. Characters like House, Sherlock Holmes, basically all the characters on The Big Bang Theory have shown us this. It is so popular in media that it is literally a TV trope the insufferable genius. And I'm sure we've all been a little bit guilty of this mentality at some point, right? It's annoying to have a conversation on a topic that you know well with someone who clearly doesn't know what they're talking about, but has an opinion anyway. And in these conversations, it's probably easy to be snarky, make dismissive statements, and eventually, if the discussion grows long enough, attacks to that person's character. 
there's an internet adage that is relevant here called Godwin's Law, which states, as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Hitler approaches one. <laughs> this is not helpful for science communication. Because as soon as you personally attack someone, you have removed their ability to think critically about that conversation. There is science behind this. In our brains, we have something called the prefrontal cortex. This is the front part of our brain that deals with information processing and decision making. You can think of it as the part of your brain that deals with rational thought. We also have the amygdala. The amygdala is a different part of your brain that deals with raw human emotion. People generally refer to it as the four Fs. Fight, flight, feeding, and finding your mate. <laughs> In low stress situations, for example, when someone is not calling you stupid or comparing you to Hitler, these two parts of your brain work together pretty well as a team to allow you to react to information and make a rational decision. But in high stress situations, when someone feels threatened or attacked, the amygdala has the power to completely turn off the prefrontal cortex. Meaning, if you personally attack someone, for example, by calling them stupid, you have scientifically removed their ability to think critically about that conversation. And so, being nice can go a long way towards science education. The second thing that we can do to help bridge that gap in scientific knowledge is to remember that the people we talk to care about different stuff than we do. And so, we must bait the hook to suit the fish. This is a helpful rule, mostly used in the marketing industry, but science educators can benefit from it as well. It basically means to focus on the interests of your audience. Talk about what they care about, not what you think they should care about. An example related to climate change on how not to do this is polar bears. Now, I don't want to say nobody cares about polar bears, but not that many people care about polar bears, and so we shouldn't be using them as a mascot for why everybody should care about climate change. Instead, know your audience. One of the best ways to know your audience is to categorize people, and there are many ways to categorize people, but one of the most popular ways, and one of the most powerful ways, is political. There's this idea that conservatives will never care about climate change. That's not true. We're just not generally good at tailoring our message in a way that speaks to them. Researchers of political psychology have found that liberals tend to value fairness, equality, protection from harm, and empathy, while conservatives more deeply value loyalty, purity, patriotism, and respect for authority. And so when you're talking to a conservative about climate change, don't talk about saving the planet, right? Instead, frame your arguments about fighting climate change as a way to make their land, water, and air pure. Talk to them about how dirty and disgusting America was before environmental regulations. Recent studies out of Stanford have shown that conservatives are more likely to support environmental policies when they are framed to their values in this way. Or talk about how climate change is a national security threat putting our military in danger. President Trump's Secretary of Defense has said, climate change is impacting stability in areas of the world where our troops are operating today. This is the case because global warming adds heat to our planet, and that excess heat acts like a powerful battery energizing our weather events. This means more powerful storms and hurricanes, longer droughts, record-breaking heat waves, and sea level rise that is changing the landscape here and abroad. Last year, President Trump signed the National Defense Authorization Act, which specifically cited climate change as a direct threat to national security. In the bill, it states, as global temperatures rise, droughts and famines can lead to more failed states, which are breeding grounds of extremist and terrorist organizations. The bill went on to point out the dangers of sea level rise, saying, in the Marshall Islands, an Air Force radar installation built on an atoll at a cost of one billion dollars is projected to be underwater within two decades. In the defense community, climate change is known as a national security risk, 
putting military lives and military money in danger. This message of climate change will reach different people than when we talk about polar bears. Bait the hook to suit the fish. Today, in our country, there is an unfortunate gap between what the public believes and what scientists know. The first step to bridging that gap is to stop assuming that those who don't believe in the science are stupid. It is way more nuanced than that, and we will never understand that nuance unless we choose to be kind, unless we choose to lead with empathy and respect and learn what these communities care about. And so if you are someone who wants to work to bridge this gap in scientific knowledge, you have to ask yourself, is your goal to be right? Or is it to change people's minds? Because if all you want to be is right, then go ahead, be snarky, make fun of that person, call them stupid. You may be right about the science, but you'll be right in isolation because that is a one-sided conversation. But if you want to be persuasive, if you want to make a difference, then you have to be nice. You have to realize that science storytelling is not one size fits all because everybody cares about different things. Essentially, if you want to be an agent of change, don't be stupid. You have to make the science nicer. Thank you.